not surprised at all. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Said don't touch my handwriting. You'll be alright. So what you say, a messy handwriting is a sign of genius. <laughs> Now you probably don't know what that means, but we're going to get to it in a second. I want to ask you a question this morning. What do you think is the most used title by <coughs> Jesus? What do you think Jesus went by the most? You may think Messiah or the Christ, because we like to call him Jesus Christ. But that's not it. You may think the Son of God, and he most certainly is the Son of God. But that's not it either. It is this title called Aneos Tau Anthropos. And uh, it means the Son of Man. The Son of Man. He calls himself, it, or he's called the Son of Man 30 times in Matthew. He's called the Son of Man 15 times in Mark. He's called the Son of Man 25 times in Luke. He's called the Son of Man 12 times in John. He's called the Son of Man 78 times. He calls himself the uh, Son of Man 78 times. And I have to ask, why does it matter? Now, some people will tell you the only reason he goes by Son of Man, or Aeneas Tau Anthropos, is because he's trying to emphasize that he is a man. Well, if that's the case, why wouldn't he just say, I'm a man? There's words for that, and in fact, he does. Multiple times in the Gospel, Go by the simple wording of man. But no, he uses this specific wording, son of man. <coughs> Why? Ezekiel, he's called the son of man in scripture. David goes by the son of man in scripture. Um, we see it in Numbers. We see it even in Daniel, chapter 8. He call, uh, Daniel is called the son of man. However, we, we have to acknowledge here, that he is calling back to something very specific. This is a very specific title, and it means something. It is very important that Jesus, <clears throat> 78 times, more than any other title, calls himself the Son of Man. Obviously, like I just said, it's not just a plea to his humanity, but it, it's something more. In the book of Daniel, which we're going to be looking at today, Daniel... There's one chapter that's written in Aramaic, and that is the, Jesus, uh, the, the language that Jesus spoke. It's the only chapter in the Bible that's written in Aramaic. And so, whenever Daniel uses the wording, son of man, Jesus used that same exact wording. Okay, so be turning your, your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. I hope that through this study we can really realize why this title was so important to Jesus and why Jesus calls himself the Son of Man 78 times. Before we get into it, I want to pray really fast. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning praising your name, Father. We pray that this study will, will enrich us and that we will, we will realize why this study or this name was so important to you, Father. And we pray that we will learn something through it and that we will be able to glorify you even more, Father. We pray that this worship will be glorifying to you. And it's through your son's name that we pray. Amen. Now, Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It is an amazing book. It is probably my favorite in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a book about prayer. It's a book about persecution. It's a book about prophecy. The three Ps, very convenient. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at the prayer portion. This morning, though, we're going to look at prophecy. And it's very important in uh, Daniel. Daniel is split into two halves. The first six chapters are about the life of Daniel, basically a biography about Daniel. The uh, chapters 7 through 12 are about the visions of Daniel and the prophecies that Daniel received. So some people are confused. Whenever you get to chapter 7, it seems like it goes back. Well, that's because the first half is about Daniel's life. The second half is about his visions and prophecies. So, 
to get appropriate context for Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man term is used, I want to go back to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, which directly correlates with 7. Daniel chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, could drink out of them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank out of them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So we see that the kingdom of Babylon is this very idolistic empire. They, their gods are gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. They do not praise the only true and living God. In fact, they're self-praising themselves. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, stands in front of thousands of people, which is, seems very godlike. He's standing in front of thousands of people and he's drinking his wine. Very self-praise, we're, we're seeing there. Very idolistic. He's making himself an idol. He's making all these, these silver, bronze, gold, iron, wood, and stone idols. There, He's making those idols. He's making them gods. Um, also, we must point out that whenever um, the, some of you might see in your Bibles, Chaldea, or the Chaldeans, that's the same exact thing as Babylon or Babylonians. It's the same name, uh, just pointing that out. Uh, continuing on, verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face became pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hips joints loosened, and his knees began, began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. The king began speaking and said to the wise men of Babylon, Anyone who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation is to, be, uh, to me shall be clothed with purple and have the necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even more pale, and his nobles were perplexed. So this hand starts writing on the wall. I wish I could have been there to see that, because that must have been terrifying. That, that comes straight from a horror movie. Just a, a hand, there's no body, just a hand writing on a wall, that's terrifying. And so the king, he's terrified, and he's also, uh, he, get, he begins even uh, to get even more terrified when no, no one can explain it. He, try, he gets all the smartest people in the kingdom. He gets all of his magicians, sorcerers, the, these people that, that praised him, and none of them can interpret this. The smartest people in the kingdom. And Belshazzar, who considered himself a god as well, he couldn't interpret it. So, his authority is now being questioned, probably. People are probably like, this Belshazzar guy, he, he's a fraud. He's not a, he's not a god. He's not a king. He doesn't deserve to be standing in the presence of a thousand. He doesn't deserve that. And so we see that Belshazzar, he's horrified. It says, that, it says in scripture that his face grew even more pale and his nobles were perplexed. Let's uh, skip down to verse 17. Verse 17. We see that the queen then offers a solution. The queen is going to bring forth this guy named Daniel to interpret it. And she knows that Daniel can uh, read visions. So verse 17. And Daniel also worked under King Nebuchadnezzar, which is Belshazzar's father. Verse 17, it seems that Daniel um, lost some of, his, um, some of his authority in between Daniel 4 and 5. We can't be certain of that, but it does seem like that happened. Verse 17, uh, then Daniel replied and said, actually let's start at verse 16. This is, Bausch or, this is uh, Daniel speaking. 
But I personally have heard, or this is uh, Balshazar speaking, sorry. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel replies, Then Daniel replied and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself. Or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to you. O king, the most high God, granted me sovereignty, greatness, honor, and majesty to your uh, father Nebuchadnezzar. Now because of the greatness which he was granted, all the peoples, nations, and populations of the lang uh, languages trembled and feared in his presence. Whoever, whoever he wished, he killed, and whoever he... Whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. God, as we can see in the scripture, gave Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty over his kingdom. Now this brings up a, a, a problem. Isn't God sovereign? Isn't he all-powerful? Doesn't he have authority over all things? Here's, here's a nice fact that we need to learn. God giving up some authority does not mean he's giving up his sovereignty. Okay, because God has the, uh, the right to take that away, and he has the ability to take away. Uh, some people, Calvinists, to be honest, they say that if we have free will, and that if we have um, a decision in our own salvation, then we're the sovereign ones, and God's not the sovereign ones. Well, no, because God, being the sovereign being that he is, lets us do that. Okay, God did not have to do that, though. He has the ability to take that away. So he's still sovereign over us, even though he gives us a choice. And that's, that's something amazing about God. Um, all of our positions, all of our choices, all of our rights come directly from God. And God has the ability to take that away, as we're about to see with Belshazzar, starting in verse 20. But when his, spirit, his heart was arrogant, and his spirit became so overbearing that he behaved presumptuously, he was deposed from his royal th throne, and his dignity was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of animals, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sits sets up over it whomever he wishes. God deposed of the king Nebuchadnezzar because God is sovereign. Proves the point that um, we're trying to make here. Going on to verse 22. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. But you have risen up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine out of them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, nor hear, nor understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath, and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Belshazzar did not learn from the mistakes of his father. Belshazzar did the exact same thing that his father did. And the handwriting, the hand on the wall, that was God. And we're about to see what God's saying to him. Continuing on, verse 25. Now this is the inscription that was written. Now, I'm learning Greek, but I have no idea what Hebrew is, to be honest. So... So, we're going to try our best to pronounce this. Mene, mene, tekel at parison. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. It's very interesting. If you look at Egyptian the, uh, mythology, which I used to be fascinated in, it, once you died, your soul, which uh, was put in physical form, I guess, was weighed against a feather. And if your soul was heavier than the feather, then you were sent to the underworld. If it was lighter than a feather, then you were okay. 
and that's that's obviously Anubis isn't real, and none of that's real. But there is some truth in that. God weighs the kingdom of Belshazzar, and he weighs our souls also. And if we have not been justified by Christ's blood, then we blood, then we will be found deficient, and we will fall just as Belshazzar is about to fall. Now, what about the civilians in the kingdom? You may ask, well, why can't he just kill Belshazzar and the civilians go free? The civilians are okay. Um, they, they still have their little kingdom. Babylon doesn't have to fall. Well, their ultimate allegiance was to God. And so they were also punished for not approving of Belshazzar, or for approving of Belshazzar. Their, uh, their allegiance was to Belshazzar instead of God. And so we have to look at this in terms of today with America. Belshazzar's kingdom of idolism and self-worship was numbered, and it was found deficient. We are doing the same exact stuff in America, brethren. And now I'm not I'm not going to sit up or stand up here and say that America is going to fall tomorrow, and that we're. We're going to suffer the same fate that Belshazzar... Well, one day we will suffer the same fate. America will not stand forever. Um, and I'm sorry to say that. Our allegiance needs to be to God and to what God has commands for us instead of maybe America. Okay, I love my country and all that, but if it, as Johnny has said from this pulpit many times, if it was to fall tomorrow, we would be okay because our allegiance is to God instead of America. And I think that's what God's trying to tell us here. People were submissive to Belshazzar. Belshazzar was submissive to himself, and he was submissive to his false gods <clears throat> and instead of God. And sometimes we're that same way. We, we also are submissive to our idols and to ourselves instead of God. We need to turn it around. And so that brings us to Daniel chapter 7. That's the story of Belshazzar. We see at the end of the chapter that uh, Belshazzar is killed that same night and Darius the Mede uh, comes into uh, control. So let's start. Um, I won't read the first nine verses, but it talks about these four beasts. And these four beasts, um, from everything I've read in commentaries, and it's, it seems that the consensus is that this represents four empires, uh, this prophecy. And the, the point that he's trying to make is all these earthly kingdoms had fallen. All the earthly kingdoms had come from the Mediterranean Sea. That's the, uh, whenever he says in verse 2 that uh, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and then that's where the empires came. All four of these empires would come from the Mediterranean Empire, uh, Mediterranean Sea, I mean. So these four empires, what are the four empires? Because the, I believe this is a fulfilled prophecy. We see the first beast was like a lion that had the wings of an eagle. So I believe that this is the Babylonian Empire. Most scholars believe that. It was once blessed by God, but then it, in Scripture it says that the eagle's wings were cut off. So Babylon was once blessed by God, but its wings were cut off. And that's what we just read in Daniel chapter 5. The second beast would be what flowed out of the Babylonian Empire, which is the Medes and Persians. And they eventually would fall. Then we see out of the Medes and Persians, we have the leopard, which represents Greece. The reason that the uh, leopard would be Greece is because Greece conquered land very fast. What are leopards? They're very fast. Um, we, we can't outrun leopards, if you guys didn't know. Um, then we see the fourth beast, which is more powerful than any of the other three beasts, Scholars believe that would be Rome. So starting in verse 9, he's just explained these four beasts. They've all come into providence, uh, prominence. The fourth beast is more powerful than any other. Verse 9, I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, his, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands and upon thousands were serving him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court convened and the books were opened. Now the Ancient of Days is God the Father. 
God the Father is taking his seat. Thousands of, are before him. The court's convening. The books are being opened. Let's continue on. Verse 11. Then I kept looking. Because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was killed and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted for them for an appointed uh, period of time. Now, most people believe that in verse 11, the horn that stems out of the fourth beast would be the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist is very controversial. I don't know everything about it. Yeah, I will say that openly. But we see that this tenth horn, whatever it is, or it doesn't have to be the tenth horn, this horn, whatever it is, it's descending from the fourth beast. And if we are to hold to the Roman... Um, theory that the fourth beast is Rome and that the ten horns descend from Rome, then it would make sense that the tenth beast is, or the tenth horn is, Roman Catholicism. And because what is the Antichrist it's in? It's Antichrist. It is literally the opposite of Christ. And the papacy is, it's claiming that it is Jesus. It's claiming that it is God, basically. They're claiming that they, um, have replaced God, or replaced Jesus on earth, basically. That they are now the, the messenger to God. And so, obviously this is speculation, which I won't spend a lot of time on. But, some people believe that the, this is talking about the Pope, or the papacy. Not a specific person, but the papacy. The position of it. Not a specific person. And it does make sense, because if someone takes power in the papacy, and they're not okay... <laughs> That could cause a lot of problems. Like, a lot of problems. But continuing on, that's just speculation. We don't really know what he's talking about. That's just a theory that's been thrown out. Verse, 11, or verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom, so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, this is the section of the Daniel that was written in Aramaic. So, whenever he says son of man, that is the same words that Jesus was using, which is why I did all that. Um, it's the exact same words. So whenever Jesus in the New Testament is talking about him being the Son of Man, he is wanting us to turn our attention towards Daniel 7. He is wanting us to look at Daniel 7 and to see this verse, and these two verses in particular, and we're, going to, we're about to see what they really mean. Now, whenever people say, Jesus is the Son of God, yes, but what does Son really mean? We see that Jesus, the Son of God, is eternally begotten, meaning that he had no birth, unless you're talking about the physical Jesus. Yes, physical Jesus, he had a birth, and that was in, I guess it would be 3 BC, I'm not exactly sure, I didn't really look it up. Um, it would have been around that time span, and yes, his father was God, that's the point of the Incarnation, but divine Jesus had no birth. Meaning, what does what does him being the son mean? If he what if he does not have a birth, what does him being the son mean? Well, we see in ancient culture that a son is someone that receives inheritance. Brethren, if there's nothing else you get from this sermon, I I get it was a very it's a very complicated les lesson, but I feel like it's much needed. The Son means the inheritor. Jesus is inheriting the kingdom of God. He is inheriting the kingdom that God the Father had built. He's inheriting that. And we see that in Daniel 7, that the Ancient of Days is presenting before him dominion, honor, and a kingdom. And this, this Jesus, he had to be fully human, but he was also fully God, that's why it's the Son of Man. Whenever I said, um, whenever people say the Son of Man, it only means fully human, I somewhat agree with that, but I do believe there's more to it. But yes, whenever it says Son of Man, we are to think human, 
Jesus had to become a human to be presented this, this great kingdom. Well, I think he would have uh, received it regardless, but God glorified him because of what he did, as uh, Philippians tells us. So, what I want you to get from this is the Son of Man, the Son of God, is receiving this kingdom. And the reason we looked at Daniel 5 is that we see all kingdoms come to an end. Babylon came to an end. Babylon was a mighty empire. It was one of the greatest empires. The Mede-Persian Empire came to an end. The Greeks came to an end. The Romans came to an end. All of them came to an end. But there's one kingdom that will not come to an end. And that's Jesus' kingdom. There's no other kingdom that will last. As it is an eternal kingdom. All things will pass away. I want you guys to turn to Luke 22 as we, we start to come to a close this morning. Luke 22. <coughs> Luke 22, starting verse 66. When it was the day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said to him, So you are the Son of God. And he said to them, You say correctly that I am. And then they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. The Pharisees, the Caiaphas, the council of elders, all the Jews understood what Jesus said whenever he said he was the Son of Man. They understood the implications of that. Because whenever he says, I am the Son of Man, he is saying, I am the Son of God. I am the person that's going to die for your sins. I'm the person that's going to receive this inheritance from God the Father. They understood that, and they were going to kill him for that. That's why they wanted to kill him. They understood, Jesus, he is, he's trying to tell us here that whenever, every single time he says Son of Man, he wants us to point ourselves towards Daniel 7 and see that he's the one that's going to be setting up this eternal peace. That's the point of Jesus. And now, since the ascension, he has been preparing his followers to enter that kingdom. So now as I close, won't you enter that kingdom? There's so many things in life. We see in Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about how everything in life is vanity. Everything in life is monotonous. Everything. I'm sure many of you feel the same way. I feel that same way. There are things in life, it's just like, what am I doing? This is useless. None of it matters. But the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is telling us, I have a kingdom. I have an eternal kingdom prepared for you. Won't you come to that today? Brethren, you can take that step today. Today is the the biggest opportunity, it may be the last opportunity to come to God's kingdom, to enter into it, to be baptized into his body. I want you to do that now as we stand and as we sing.